Okay, it looks like it's 1030. So let's uh, get started here. Last day we started topic nine. Uh, we we're talking about sterilization and disinfection. And we were uh, basically going through some definitions about what sterilization was, disinfection. We also talked about sanitization and asepsis. Uh, and uh, we also talked about uh, uh, some of the different ways that we kill organisms. So uh, we kill them by destroying their membranes. We kill them by denaturing their proteins or doing something to their DNA. And we talked a little bit about some of the uh, variables that may come into play as to why some organisms are a little bit harder to kill than others. For example, we mentioned that endospores are extremely difficult to kill. Uh, prions are even more difficult to get rid of. And so uh, kind of depending on what you're trying to do may affect uh, which method you're going to use. So last day, I had finished off on this slide and said we are going to talk about these things here. So physical methods of microbial control. And uh, after that, we're going to talk about some chemical methods. And uh, as we go through these, like I said, uh, you've probably seen many of these things before somewhere. Uh, and uh, so I'll try to point out where you may have seen them before and uh, try to go through what are some of the appropriate uses. Some of them are important uses for some industries and maybe not other industries. So the first thing we're going to talk about is heat. You can see I've actually broken it down to different types of uh, heat sterilization methods. So pasteurization, we have moist heat and pressure and dry heat. So let's talk about these things. So heat, uh, one of the main things heat will do is denature proteins and it will also denature membranes as well. You can think of denaturing as kind of like melting. So if you think about a protein, you can see there's our little protein on the left. It's folded, it's nice, it's compact, it's uh, uh, you know, it's in a biologically functional form. When you add heat, it denatures, it melts, and it unravels. That's kind of like what you do when you cook an egg. Uh, all the proteins in the egg white in particular are soluble and floating around. And uh, when you cook it, uh, they uh, denature, they congeal, and they turn into a, kind of a little bit more of a gelatinous, uh, uh, not quite solid, but more solid than they were found in the original egg. So that's what heat is doing. Uh, so this is one way to kill things and hopefully sterilize things. So one heat method that you may be familiar with is pasteurization. And pasteurization is mostly used in the food industry for liquids. So all sorts of liquids are pasteurized, uh, milk and juices and beers and uh, all sorts of things. And this is a way to preserve food uh, so that it doesn't spoil and doesn't make us sick. Uh, before pasteurization was invented, actually pasteurization was invented by Louis Pasteur, so hopefully that one is obvious, uh, a lot of people were getting sick in particular from, uh, from drinking milk. There are lots of bacteria that can end up in milk naturally that can make very, people very, very sick. So you can see the whole idea uh, behind pasteurization is we're not going to boil something to the point where all, you know, let's say, let's talk about milk. Milk will get really... Uh, There'll be a film that will form and the taste and texture changes. So in, in this method, what we want to do is kind of just heat it quickly for a short amount of time and hopefully we'll kill most of the microbes. And that's what pasteurization is all about. So there's different treatments uh, for pasteurization. Most of these are done in, in factories and they're done in tubes. And so they're, they can control the precise temperature and the amount of time that uh, a liquid is exposed to. And like I said, the whole idea is to hopefully kill uh, most of the organisms and, uh, and make the, uh, the beverage uh, or, or food uh, safe to drink or eat. Uh, you can see there's a note there about uh, uh, that we have uh, best before dates. And uh, that's the reason why is that it may not kill everything. Uh, and you know, particularly thermophilic organisms or endospores may survive and eventually spoil the beverage or milk. Um, best before dates are a little bit of a guesswork and uh, I don't know a lot about the food industry. I think that uh, they are not even mandatory by the food industry is my understanding. Um, but they're put there uh, to hopefully give at least the grocery store an idea of when to take off the shelf. I had a friend who um, her, her family used to own a, own a convenience store so they had to take everything off the shelf on the best before date and replace it with new 
stuff, but they didn't want it to go to waste. So she actually knew uh, for every single product how long it was actually good after the best before days. So I think white milk, it was like three or four days. Uh, chocolate milk, she said, always went bad on the day of and so on. Uh, so somebody's mentioning here that she uh, makes yogurt and she lets the milk reach a boiling point and then cool a little bit. Yeah, so boiling something is uh, slightly different from pasteurization. Pasteurization is just for a brief amount of time. Uh, boiling for sterilization is done in a lot of uh, food preparation. If you ever make jam or jelly or yogurt, uh, you might boil something. And there's different protocols. You boil it till it reaches a full rolling boil or boil it for five minutes and so on. And, uh, but it's the same idea. We're adding heat to try to kill any microorganisms that are going to ruin your food. Uh, and, and so that's really uh, what boiling is. And this is a classical method. Sometimes you see it on, you know, old movies where somebody's, uh, you know, dressing a wound, let's say it's a war movie, and they're boiling all the, all the uh, tools and the, and the dressings before they put it on the, the wounded person or whatever. Uh, we do have better, better methods. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do have better methods nowadays um, besides boiling, but it will work in a pinch. But you see this note here is that boiling may not destroy endospores. And this is a big concern that we have because there are some organisms that form endospores that are very significant uh, pathogens. So what can we do against endospores uh, like this one here? I mentioned I was gonna come back and talk about C. diff. Uh, C. diff goes by a whole bunch of names, by the way. It's uh, Clostridium difficile. So Clostridium, by the way, is one of the group of organisms. These are gram positives that form endospores. Uh, we're gonna talk about the clostridium that causes tetanus later and the clostridium that causes botulism. Uh, so similarly related organisms. Uh, and uh, this one is difficult apparently, as you can see from the name. So often in, in the hospitals and, and other places, most people are calling it C. diff. Uh, sometimes you see CDF uh, as, a, as a code for it as well. And this one here is, uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's necessarily part of the natural flora, but for some people it is. They naturally have it. Uh, it's an intestinal organism. And uh, you can see there's a note there that it's associated with chronic diarrhea and inflammation. So generally what happens, and some people do pick this up in a, in a hospital, by the way, so sometimes people do refer to this as a superbug. But generally what happens is people may have this, not everyone has it, but have it living in low levels in your intestine, and, uh, and then you get sick. So maybe you have something else. Let's say you have pneumonia or something like that. And so you take antibiotics, and the antibiotics will, you know, hopefully take care of the, uh, the bacteria that are causing the pneumonia. But the endospores for C. diff don't die. And actually, C. diff is kind of resistant to a lot of antibiotics just kind of naturally. I'm not sure if that has something to do with its membranes or cell walls, but it's kind of naturally resistant to a lot of antibiotics. So when we take antibiotics for a different reason, suddenly C. diff has a chance to flourish. And it causes a pretty nasty diarrhea. Uh, I've heard it smells really bad, like rotten eggs. And uh, anybody I've talked to that have had to deal with it have said that um, uh, they, can, they can recognize the smell, smell right away. Um, and so this is something that can, uh, like I said, spread in hospitals. You can imagine there's all sorts of people in hospitals on antibiotics, and, uh, and this survives really well in the environment. Uh, one of my colleagues had it. I, I can't even remember what he said he was, he was sick for, and uh, I can't even remember what he said they put him on. But, uh, so sometimes this is uh, referred to as uh, antibiotic-induced diarrhea. Maybe I'll write that down. Antibiotic induced diarrhea. Um, I see there's a couple comments. Somebody has said, yes, it does stinks bad. And somebody was sick for weeks. And uh, in patient in hospitals, uh, they can't share the toilet. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and there's a note here about somebody having this for eight months. Uh, and eight different antibiotics. And, and that's pretty common. And uh, we're gonna talk about C. diff in, in uh, a few times. We'll come back to, to it later about what some of the treatments are. But uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is pretty serious, uh, very hard to get rid of. And like I said, my friend had it and I, I, he had it for a while and, and was, was very unhappy about the whole situation, obviously. 
and it's hard to treat. And sometimes, you know, people get a treatment and it just comes back and again and again. And so it's, uh, it, it, is, it is difficult to get rid of. Um, so somebody's asking, how do you contact it? Just fecal exposure. Yeah, basically, you can get it from other people uh, uh, very easily. Uh, some people have it naturally. But usually it doesn't flare up until you've had antibiotics for something else that have a chance to wipe out the normal microbial diversity that's in your gut. So we will come back to C. diff uh, a number of times. So how do we get rid of those endospores? Uh, we can use something called autoclaving. So autoclaving is still using heat, but we're also adding pressure. And so uh, you can see there's a little diagram of an autoclave there. So it's, uh, I'll show you some photographs in a minute. Uh, there's different sizes. Some are very small, some are very large. Uh, basically the, uh, the tools or the media or whatever you're putting is going to go in there. Uh, it's got a big door that cranks shut and it's put under uh, usually 121 degrees Celsius. And I can't remember what the, uh, what the pressure is, but that's usually enough to kill endospores uh, if it's put under those conditions for 15 minutes. So I'll show you some pictures of some autoclaves. So there's an autoclave. This is a pretty uh, kind of standard one, a uh, relatively large one that you would see uh, in um, institutions with laboratories or hospitals. And uh, you can put all sorts of things in autoclaves. Pretty much anything that is fine to get wet, right? Uh, so you can see in this case, it looks like we've got some bedding, maybe some towels. Uh, some of those containers probably have instruments. So those instruments could include uh, things like scissor scissors or tubes or anything that also is not going to get melted by that kind of heat as well. You can imagine some plastics are not going to be fine with autoclaving. So autoclaving, you know, is kind of like one of those things that's a gold standard, meaning that if it can be autoclaved, you stick it in the autoclave. Uh, obviously, we can't stick everything in there. Like I said, some things can't get wet. Some things can't uh, take the heat. Uh, we use them in the lab at Cana all the time. Ours is a little smaller. We have about three of them. Uh, this is one of our smaller ones. You can see it's kind of just sitting there on top of the bench. And we put all sorts of uh, uh, things in there. Sometimes we have petri dishes that we want to sterilize after we're done using them. We put them in there. And they're usually in a little bin or a little bag. So of course, the liquid's going to get all over uh, to protect it from splattering all over the place. I found this one on the internet. Uh, this is an enormous autoclave. Uh, so this is at some sort of uh, aerospace company. I didn't realize this, but uh, I guess, you know, they make these satellites and all the gaskets and whatnot get uh, sealed in place by putting them in these giant autoclaves. So I thought that was, that was quite something. They have them all over the place, by the way. I think I saw one at the dentist office as well, where they're probably putting their instruments in there to sterilize. So autoclaves are very, very important. Uh, hospitals, labs, uh, they're, they're found all over the place. And uh, one thing is the quality control uh, to test these things. So on a daily basis, when we stick things in an autoclave, we actually have this, uh, you just put a little piece of tape on your objects and the, and the tape uh, has stripes that, that kind of turn dark to tell you, hey, it worked. But that tape will actually go off at lower than 121 degrees. So once a month, we actually do a biological test on our autoclave. So the biological test is we have these little vials and the little vials have endospores in them, uh, bacillus endospores in particular. And when the bacillus um, can, and so what you do is you autoclave this and, uh, and then you, um, you stick it in an incubator to see if the uh, endospores are gonna grow. And you can see you, you, it's just a colored indicator in there to say, okay, the autoclave has actually passed the test and it's good to go for another month. We would do this every day, but they're kind of expensive, like anything. So once a month is the standard. So some things can't get wet. I've mentioned that uh, already. Uh, so you can use a dry heat uh, for things. So sometimes people have ovens and they have things that can't get wet and uh, things that can manage the heat. And so you stick things in these ovens and you have to leave them a lot longer. An autoclave, once it gets up to temperature, it only takes about 15, 20 minutes, depending on the volume and all that that you have. There's formulas around how long to stick things in an autoclave. Um, the whole run usually takes about an hour by the time it gets up and then cools down and all that. Dry heat, you're looking at leaving something for like 24 hours. So sometimes there are instruments that you don't want to get wet or um, 
uh, sometimes uh, I think uh, I would have to look this one up, but uh, some instruments, uh, you know, with the water and the way the steam works, there's concerns about uh, sharp edges getting dull. So dry heat can be used for these kind of objects. And like I said, it's usually come out something like 24 hours or something like that. Um, another type of dry heat is just incineration. So sometimes there are dressings or disease things and they're just in large numbers. And incineration basically means you burn it up, right? And uh, this, is, this is pretty common for, for some uh, types of things. So this is just a table showing, hey, you know, we can kill endospores in an autoclave. And you can see it's taking anywhere from one to 10 minutes for most uh, of these uh, common pathogenic uh, organisms. In the dry heat, similar temperature, it takes a lot longer. So like I said, most protocols for dry heat or leave things for eight hours, 16 hours or 24 hours, just to make sure that everything on there is killed. So heat is good, okay? Uh, we can't use heat for everything. Um, so, you know, sometimes we're using other methods. Uh, one method to not sterilize things, but uh, you know, that can be helpful is using low temperatures. So low temperatures might include freezing. So freezing doesn't necessarily kill bacteria or endospores, but freezing um, can kill a lot of parasites. So if you like sushi, this is a good thing. This is actually standard practice in Canada. Uh, we can't serve sushi as is has to be frozen first. So um, again, there's an issue with freezing. Sometimes it will you know, affect the taste and all that. So in Canada, most uh, sushi restaurants, they're using flash freezing. So they're using liquid nitrogen or something like that. And that will kill all the eggs. Because you know, um, every single fish out there, <laughs> every single fish out there is loaded with parasites. Uh, and so you know, we want to protect people, right? And you remember all those flukes that we talked about? And uh, well, we're just trying to protect ourselves against that. So, you know, they're found in there in eggs and little larvae that are all microscopic. And we, like I said, we want to protect ourselves. Uh, like I said, there's different methods for freezing and preparing sushi. Uh, once in a while, uh, I would say every, uh, you know, every year or two, I'll see a news report about somebody who's gone somewhere else. And uh, apparently what's really popular is uh, there's some sort of freshwater sushi that you can get in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, once in a while, people come back with uh, some sort of parasite. There's a biologist in Ontario who was in the news and he was certain there was something in his eye. He eventually pulled a worm out of his eye uh, and, the, and then they identified it as, uh, as related to this uh, freshwater sushi he had in Mexico. So I thought it was kind of interesting. So other low temperature things are used all the time. Uh, we're trying to protect things. So we're obviously doing this with food. We're trying to protect our food so that it will at least slow down organisms from growing. Uh, not everything will be slowed down. We mentioned uh, molds and listeria as well, but, uh, and we're also preserving the biological integrity of a lot of things in fridges, such as uh, vaccines and, and other preparations that will, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, they have their best before dates. And if you want to keep them fresh, uh, we need to maintain the, uh, the cold chain. This is a big issue for vaccines in uh, developing countries, right? So, you know, you need to deliver vaccines to places without electricity and all that. And so maintaining the cold chain is a big, uh, um, a big uh, uh, a thing that needs to be figured out before vaccines and can sometimes get delivered to uh, remote locations. But not really sterilizing anything here, mostly just slowing things down. So another thing we can do to get rid of organisms uh, is we can filter them out. So we do this sometimes in the lab. Um, you know, autoclave run, it takes an hour about, right? And sometimes I have small amounts of liquids that I want sterilized. So I can filter them, right? Uh, you can get filters of different sizes. So you can see here I have filters of different sizes. Uh, this one here is the most commonly used filter is the 0.22 microns that will get rid of most bacteria, probably not viruses, but usually contamination in my things in the lab is bacterial, so I want that. Why am I not using the really small one? Because it's hard to get things through these filters in general. They can be very slow. So the 0.22 microns is a pretty good uh, uh, kind of compromise. You can see a 0.22 micron filter in that picture in the bottom right, and the bacterial cells are not able to fit through it. 
So usually what you do is you have a sterile uh, piece of glassware already. Um, sometimes it's plasticware. These are things that you can buy. And I have, let's say it's a buffer or a solution I've made in the lab, and I just uh, push it through a filter. Uh, this is not the device I use. Uh, the one I have, uh, we have something that uh, comes from a company and, and the filters attach right onto it. They come uh, pre-wrapped and sterile, and you can do this very quickly. Like I said, if you have, if you have small volumes, uh, very easy to do. Uh, we also have uh, filters uh, in the lab in this biological safety cabinet. So we have to have a biological safety cabinet for working with large uh, volumes of, uh, of bacteria. And it has something called a HEPA filter. So you may have seen the term HEPA filter. There are a lot of things out there. Some of them are HEPA filters and some are just claiming to be HEPA filters. Uh, but they're getting more and more common in, uh, in buildings. And so there are certain types of buildings where they might be putting HEPA filters. I'm not entirely sure about the swimming pool, um, but they're starting to get them built into swimming pools and you're filled, you know, the whole idea is we want to filter out mold and particularly in swimming pools uh, because of all the moisture there. Uh, but uh, HEPA filters are used to filter air in, uh, in certain areas of hospitals. So if a hospital has a, a wing or a unit for, let's say, burns victims, um, it's a good idea to filter the air because the biggest risk to people with severe burns is getting skin infections. So they put these HEPA filters and the air goes through these HEPA filters. Um, not necessarily going to remove everything, but uh, HEPA filters apparently are pretty highly efficient. I actually talked to a HEPA filter salesman a number of years ago, and he was complaining that, that you see lots of things nowadays branded as HEPA filters, like vacuum cleaners, and he says they're not HEPA filters, they're not meeting that high standard. They're probably better than normal vacuum filters, but they're not HEPA filters. Um, so, like I said, this is pretty common for a lot of equipment nowadays and starting to get built into certain buildings um, if they're concerned about air quality, particularly, like I said, uh, um, areas of hospitals that are, are dealing with uh, burns victims. So large hospitals might have these. And newer buildings, obviously. So one method of microbial control that is ancient uh, and used for the food industry is desiccation. So you can see here on the right, there's a fish market and they're drying the fish out in the sun and they're gonna have some dried meat. So desiccation does not sterilize things. It just removes the water and the microbes aren't growing because the water is gone. Uh, a lot of endospores, a lot of microbes will kind of go into a dormant state. And as soon as water returns, uh, we can have more microorganisms there. So desiccation is actually a big concern in hospitals that microbes have, are sitting somewhere, dried out, and just ready for reinfection. So things like beddings and dressings and things like that are, are things that have to be sterilized uh, before they're reused. And in some cases, we sterilize them before we throw them out. And it just depends on the, uh, the context. Okay, so autoclaving, uh, very important, right? Uh, a lot of these other methods just have their little places. Uh, another big method that is getting uh, a lot more uh, press, uh, particularly lately, is radiation. And uh, there's different types of radiation that I want to talk about, but the big one is UV radiation. So somebody is asking about using salt as a desiccant. Yeah, so I think I have that on in the, in the actual notes about um, uh, osmotic pressure, it's usually called, uh, meaning you're, you're sucking up the water using salt, but it's really the same idea, uh, drying something out using just a different method. Um, yeah, so let's talk about radiation. And uh, uh, so what is radiation? Radiation is um, uh, energy found in, uh, you know, uh, different types of, uh, uh, you know, we've got uh, microwave radiation, we've got UV visible radiation and things like that. And you can see in my note here, it says good for sterilizing items like plastic that cannot be heated, right? So it turns out there's two types of radiation. We call them ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So let's take a quick look at both of them and they both have their uses. Uh, so ionizing radiation, if you're interested in the physics, you can see that the wavelengths are actually smaller and non-ionizing radiation, the wavelengths are bigger. So non-ionizing radiation, a um, whole bunch of things out there like cell phones, microwaves, radios, uh, getting into the infrared and visible range and a tiny bit of the ultraviolet range. As we get into the ultraviolet range, 
uh, we're talking about higher energy and therefore more damage to something in particular, which is your DNA. So what do I mean by ionizing radiation? Ionizing radiation means it can actually break chemical bonds, it can make ions. So we're talking about things like X-rays, gamma rays, um, and certain types of ultraviolet light. So UVB and UVC. Uh, you don't need to know the difference between all the different UVs. It's just kind of the range of uh, wavelengths and the amount of energy in there. Uh, but these are the ones that are going to um, possibly cause cancer, right? UVB and UVC, uh, they're because they're damaging DNA. And when you damage DNA, you can mess with people's genes, which and if those genes have something to do with the cell cycle, uh, they can cause cancer. Uh, same thing with x-rays and gamma rays. And uh, so that's why, uh, you know, if you are um, getting an x-ray or if you're administering an x-ray, uh, you know, um, people are going to protect themselves. Um, so there's these lead vests, protect all the organs except for maybe the part being irradiated. Uh, it's going to be very quick. And the person who's giving the x-ray is usually stepping out of the room. Uh, there's kind of a formula in terms of how, how much distance. I think it's something like five meters or something like that uh, it is usually safe because, of course, if they're running that thing all day long, um, we, don't, we want to minimize the amount of radiation you're exposed to. You know, all this radiation can cause cancer, right? So, you know, when we're giving people x-rays, you know, we're weighing the, the benefits with the risks. You know, if you're only getting one or two x-rays a year, uh, it's not that different from the amount of radiation you're experiencing just from the geology of our planet. Um, but it is, it, is, uh, it is a little bit of extra risk, right? So we do want to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, people are starting to use uh, ionizing radiation for um, doing this on food nowadays. And uh, in the United States, uh, you can see this symbol here, right? In the United States, there are laws that say it has to be labeled. There are food lobby groups concerned that they're irradiating food. Oh no, our food is radioactive. Um, that's not true, right? It's kind of like an x-ray. Uh, you turn that x-ray on, it lasts like a second, and then it turns it off. It doesn't mean that your body is now emitting x-rays. It's the same thing with the food. We're hitting it for you. It's getting hit for a short amount of time with some sort of radiation. I don't know if it's x-rays or gamma rays for the food industry, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and the whole idea is they're trying to destroy or at least damage DNA in the pathogens that are on those strawberries. So the pathogens are gonna, gonna include uh, mold and other, other things like bacteria. And so you can see that the irradiated food, it stays fresh much longer than the non-irradiated food. But again, in the United States, it's labeled because of, of concerns um, from some lobby groups a number of years ago. In Canada, I don't think it has to be labeled, and I'm not really sure what the practices are in which types of foods get irradiated, uh, but you know, something maybe, uh, um, if you know anything about it, just let me know. I think it's, I think it's interesting, it works really well. Um, there are lower types of radiation, lower energy, called um, uh, non-ionizing, uh, so this includes things like microwaves and your cell phone, uh, radiation and um, so these things here don't damage the DNA um, although it's showing it's it, uh, the UVA it's showing here can damage the DNA as far as I know it doesn't damage the DNA I'm gonna have to look that up but I'm pretty sure UVA doesn't damage DNA but it is enough to give you a, a, a suntan uh, and, and enough to give you heat as you know microwaves are giving heat so this one I'm going to have to look up because uh, by definition non-ionizing radiation should not be damaging DNA but um, again, I'll have, to, I'll have to double check my chemistry on that one. So here is one thing that UV light can do to DNA, right? It can, uh, it can kind of swap the bonds around. So if you take a look, this is a thymine here, right? And uh, thymine, and here's another thymine. And so thymine, uh, it's not shown here in this diagram, but it has some double bonds on it. And what the uh, radiation is doing is just making these electrons a little kind of excited and they're kind of popping out of this thymine here and they're connecting to this thymine. So chemical bonds are just electrons, right? And so now you have this little funny thing here called the thymine dimer, right? And uh, now it's not normal DNA. Now you have a mistake in your genetic code. And there's a whole bunch of reactions like this. It doesn't just have to be thymines. It could be, uh, it could be something else. Uh, this is just one that's really well understood. 
Uh, and uh, when you have damage in, in your, your DNA, uh, you're going to have non-functional genes. So we don't like this as humans, right? We don't want to get too much UV and we don't want to have skin cancer or other kind of cancers. Um, but if you use this radiation and you hit things hard enough, uh, you can damage enough DNA that they're basically not going to be able to reproduce. So there's all sorts of UV sterilizers out there nowadays that uh, can be purchased. Uh, I saw this one on the internet. Uh, it was marketed towards, I think, uh, nail salons. So in nail salons, uh, I'm not familiar with nail salons. Uh, I have personally not been to one, but I imagine they have all sorts of tools and instruments, scissors and clippers and things like that that are touching people. And um, so, you know, how do they sterilize these things quickly? Uh, they can use these UV sterilizers. Now, these UV sterilizers are using UVB and UV um, C rays. So these are higher, um, higher energy uh, uh, radiation, and uh, and they're killing things very quickly. So I mentioned that UV uh, sterilization is, is coming into. It's been in the news a lot lately because there are these companies trying to sell these devices where uh, it's the stand-up UVC lamp. So UVC is very high intense uh, uh, radiation, and, and the idea is, you know, we want to sterilize these rooms and we want to sterilize them very quickly. So let's stick it in the room. People go out of the room and you come back 10 minutes later, maybe the room is sterile. Um, so I don't know how effective these are. I just know I've seen them in the news and people are trying to sell them. And uh, as long as nobody's in the room, nobody's at risk of getting cancer because once it's turned off. Uh, I'm mentioning these because they're very common for sterilizing plastics. So a lot of plastics uh, from companies, you can see I have some plastic syringes, some plastic Petri dishes there and they are um, going to be sterilized at the manufacturer and these plastics will warp with an autoclave and so how do you sterilize them well you just throw them in some sort of uv device and uh, they can get sterilized that way and they end up receiving them and they end a plastic bag so that the plastic bag is sterile as well so obviously the radiation has to hit it so if you have something that's not transparent i'm showing you here this pipetter and uh, the pipetter has gears and whatnot in the insides, I probably wouldn't be able to sterilize that pipetter uh, because the UV light is not gonna penetrate through the dark parts of the plastic. So somebody's asking about atomic bombs and the radiation there. Uh, the radiation from atomic bombs is intense. We're talking about really high energy radiation, gamma and X-rays, and I think there's even something that's higher intensity. So that's enough to not just give you cancer, but if you're close enough, uh, you're talking about people with melting flesh and things like that, which is kind of terrifying. Uh, I saw this also on the internet. Uh, I think I found it on Amazon. This is a little UV sterilizer thingy that you can get. And, you know, if you're concerned, I think they were marketing and saying, you, you know, if you go to a hotel room and, and apparently some people in hotel rooms are really germophobic about the TV remote. Uh, and so they were, there was a little video demonstration showing somebody sterilizing the, uh, the TV remote. Um, you know, and it was advertising this as a good travel device, so you can sterilize what you need to do there. I would be careful, though, using it on something like a cell phone. Uh, you're going to have, um, you know, it's going to reflect, and the person could actually get a little bit of skin damage or sunburn on their, on their hands if they're not careful. Particularly if it goes into the eyes, you can get eye damage. Uh, I'm showing you another uh, UV lamp there. You can see uh, this one here is, uh, it looks like it's in a, um, a vent duct. So this is something I do know they have at McDonald Island um, in, the, uh, uh, in the pool area, is the air going in and out of the, uh, the pool area is sterilized by these germicidal UV lamps. And this, like I said, is to cut down on mold and, and other things like that. Uh, UV is also used at the water treatment plant as well as, a, uh, uh, as, as a, a sterilizing factor. So what does UV do? I think I mentioned already is it doesn't necessarily kill the organisms, but it damages their DNA so that they can't reproduce. So that's kind of good enough. It means that they're, you know, they might still be able to metabolize at least for a while. Um, it doesn't destroy them outright, but it damages their DNA so they can't reproduce. Okay, so that is our physical methods of microbial control. Uh, there are a few other things out there and, and nuances to these things, but like I said, the big thing here is autoclaving is super important. Uh, UV radiation is getting to be more important for some things. 
And uh, everything else kind of has its little nuances, you know, where it might be useful. Like I said, filtration, for example, has its uses in, in certain circumstances, not necessarily used all the time. Uh, same thing with like pasteurization is more of a food industry thing. Um, as far as I know, I don't really know if, any, if there are any medical supplies that are pasteurized. That's something I don't really know. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears. I want to talk about chemical disinfectants. So notice I've switched words now, right? I've gone from talking about sterilizing things and now I'm talking about disinfecting, right? So sterilizing usually means you're killing everything. Maybe not the prions, but prions aren't even alive. They're proteins. Um, to disinfecting. So disinfecting is where we're trying to, uh, you know, hopefully kill most. It'd be nice to kill everything. Uh, but usually it's something on a surface and that surface may not be sterile uh, for much longer anyway. So this could be a countertop or, uh, you know, uh, it could be a doorknob or payphone or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, if you want to disinfect a room before a new patient comes in or, you know, uh, we're talking about disinfecting things all the time now at the college, you know, when, when people are using a room or, or whatever, right? So I want to talk about some of these chemicals. Uh, and uh, and what their uses are and I know this is a big long list and, and like I said I think you've seen some of these before so let's talk about them first group here are the phenol and phenolics um, so there's the chemistry of these things right so phenol is a, is a benzene ring with an alcohol group on it and uh, it's a um, quite a strong reactive chemical uh, this was actually used by Joseph Lister uh, when the germ theory of disease was kind of a new thing. He was a surgeon and, and he realized we got to sterilize surgical rooms. And so he was using phenol. And phenol is nasty. I've worked with it and it'll burn your skin uh, and it smells bad. It gives you a headache, but boy, does it work. Uh, and so most people who are using some sort of phenolic, which, is, which means it's a phenol derivative, and you can see there's a couple of examples there. Uh, down below and they're usually less um, not quite as strong uh, but a good thing about phenols is they're very persistent chemicals so some of the ones that you may have seen before I know I have some pictures here are things like products like Mr. Clean or Pine Sol and usually they add you know a little bit of scent to it maybe a lemon scent or something like that because you know the chemicals themselves do have an odor to them but they're relatively persistent and they're relatively stable. So that's why they're good for things like doing floors, right? It, it, will, it will stay on the floor for a while and, uh, you know, um, uh, do its, its stuff, you know, act against the bacteria. Uh, phenol is reactive. It will denature proteins and membranes uh, and, and all sorts of other things. I'm showing this one here, uh, triclosan. So I'm not sure what the state of it is in Canada at the moment, but uh, it's starting to get banned in a lot of products in the United States. Um, and it used to be found in everything. So what you're actually seeing here uh, is, um, actually no, it says drug, doesn't it? Uh, but you used to see it a lot in, uh, sometimes you'd buy dish detergent and the dish detergent would say antibacterial dish detergent. And that meant it had triclosan in it. Uh, for environmental reasons, and of course, you know, if you overuse a chemical, sometimes you start to get resistance. Uh, but there's a number of reasons why we're we're trying to get rid of it in certain products. In, in some products, it's still it's still a good thing to have, but it was certainly something that was overused. Like I said, it's starting to ban a lot of products in the U.S. in the last couple of years. I don't know a ton about that, uh, so it's something I'd have to look into. It. I just know I don't see it as much anymore in Canada. So maybe we're doing the same thing. So that's phenols and phenolics, right? Uh, they are very persistent, so that's a good thing. Um, something on the opposite end of the spectrum that's not persistent are alcohols. So we see alcohols everywhere. Uh, nowadays, we see hand sanitizer all over the place. Uh, there's also alcohol swabs that you might have, uh, uh, might, uh, have been used on your skin before getting a, a flu shot or something like that. Uh, and they're often found in first aid kits. So um, alcohols primarily dissolve membranes. So I think I was showing you last day a little photo of some alcohol mixing with a membrane. So anything with a membrane is going to be affected. So you can see in my note here, fungi, bacteria, 
and envelope viruses. So non-envelope viruses are not usually affected. Um, most alcohols we're looking at about 65% ethanol and 70% isopropanol. 100% is actually less effective. This is what the science shows us. Uh, I don't think there's really a good answer as to why. Probably the water actually helps it dissolve and get access to the, uh, the membranes uh, of the cells, but I'm not, I'm not sure if we entirely fully understand it. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of these products out here, like I said, hand sanitizers and whatnot, and if they are not in that range, 65 to 75% uh, alcohol, uh, don't trust them. Uh, I noticed uh, with this pandemic, there's been a bunch of recalls on hand sanitizers, and why is that? Usually they're skimping out 50% ethanol or something like that. Uh, like I said, the science is pretty clear on this, that the 65 to 75% range is the most effective, uh, and if they're skimping out, uh, then it may not be effective. Often they'll have other things in there, you know, sometimes things to make it more gel-like or aloe vera, or, you know, sometimes there's odors to them or colors to make them fun or, or whatever, but the active ingredient is, is ethanol or isopropanol. Uh, there are some hand sanitizers out there that don't have alcohols in them. Um, there have been cinnamon ones, for example. Now, cinnamon oil does have antibacterial properties, so don't want to pick on that one just in, in particular but probably not as effective as the alcohols. Uh, there are other wipes out there. I thought I had, um, you know, I'll come back to that previous one in a moment. There are other products out there that may have other things in them. Uh, so I think somebody uh, not too long ago was asking about the Cavi wipes. Uh, you can go on their website and there's actually a whole bunch of different types. Uh, some of them are apparently, you know, more active against MRSA or tuberculosis. Uh, this one here apparently was, I, I thought that was interesting. And you can look up the recipes. Now you may notice this one here is actually less alcohol in it, okay? So, but the other thing to notice is that this has, so two types of alcohols, so that's interesting. And then it has this other thing here, right? So this other thing here, uh, benzalkonium chloride, uh, is a detergent. And so um, I'm not really sure about the science behind the cavi wipes but probably somebody has determined that this particular formulation helps the alcohol get into the membranes and then kill the, uh, these particular organisms. Um, again, when you're working with formulations, uh, there's probably some uh, you know, carefully guarded uh, trade secrets and, and you know, they're not gonna share their data with you. Um, they're just gonna give you uh, what they think is important for marketing. And so there's a few different cavi wipes out there, but you're looking at a mixture of two different things, like I said, a detergent and, and a couple of alcohols here now. And butoxy uh, ethanol as well, by the way, is a lot more reactive than normal isopropyl and ethanol. And because uh, uh, it has a butoxy group on it, which is, uh, which is something relatively reactive. Um, I don't know how effective it is against microorganisms because it's not that commonly used, uh, but apparently the cavi white people like it. So, um, yeah, I was just, you know, I guess I said this already, right? Uh, you know, there's always the question that pops up. What about hand sanitizers and what about soap? So this is the official statement from the Center for Disease Control. And they said, you want something with a high concentration of alcohol. But notice what they say here at the bottom. Soap and water are more effective than hand sanitizers. So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because I wanna, I, uh, one of my other um, items on this list to talk about is soap and detergent. So we'll get back, back to that in a moment. So just be patient. So another uh, disinfectant uh, of which comes in a variety of types are the halogens. So halogens, uh, if you took chemistry way back in the day, high school or whatever, uh, you may remember halogens are a particular group on the periodic table. They include bromine. We don't want to be using bromine. Bromine is very reactive. Um, but we can use things like iodine. So iodine uh, classically used to be found in first aid kits all the time. You don't see it as much anymore. Um, but it's a good, you can see the word here, antiseptic. So remember that means we're using it on our skin, right? It's something that is not going to poison you. And uh, they're reactive enough that they will damage proteins in bacteria, uh, but not poison enough that uh, a small amount on your skin is going to kill you or really do any harm. Um, bleach, on the other hand, is a bit more reactive. We don't want to be sticking bleach on people's bodies. Uh, it, it, it's a lot more reactive. Um, 
you see Clorox is one of the big brands and it has chlorine in it, which is also um, a halogen, right? So these things are, are uh, you know, relatively reactive compounds is really what we're looking at here. And they oxidize things, in particular, they'll oxidize proteins, probably just about anything else in their path. Um, something else that sort of fits into that group, but it's not the same group in the periodic table, is the peroxygens. Um, and so this is something that you see in more frequently now than iodine in first aid kits is hydrogen peroxide. Um, if you've ever bleached your hair, this is what was in the bleaching agent, hydrogen peroxide. And so again, we've got a relatively reactive compound. Um, exposed to the human body for antisepsis, it's not too bad for short amounts of time. Long amounts of times, it will start to damage things like the color in your hair. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not too bad. And uh, you may have seen bubbles, and that's when it's breaking down and producing oxygen. So notice the one nice thing about peroxygens is it is effective against endospores. So that is a good thing. We want to kill endospores. Uh, another oxidizing agent, which is not going to be used for medical purposes, is ozone. So some water treatment plants, for example, use ozone, not in Fort McMurray, but uh, uh, some do use ozone as a, as a way to kill organisms in water. And uh, in particular, ozone is really good at killing endospores and protal cysts. And so, um, you know, it's very effective. It's just very dangerous to work with. So uh, usually you don't find it in smaller cities like Fort McMurray. Usually they have these giant um, ozone plants. Uh, not always the case. There are some smaller ones. Okay, so let's talk about soaps. So soaps and detergents uh, fall into a category of, of chemicals called surfactants. So this is kind of a chemistry thing where what we're trying to say is that this molecule, whether it's a soap or a detergent, has a hydrophobic component to it and hydrophilic, so a polar and a non-polar part to it. So you can see they're trying to show these little soap molecules here. They look like little, like little helium balloons. And what you have here is a you know, polar head of some sort. And then we have a fatty acid nonpolar tail, right? And uh, so it's kind of like phospholipids, right? They have that polar and nonpolar parts. And so what soaps and detergents do is that they can damage membranes. And that's what's shown in this picture here. Uh, but the reality is the biggest thing that they're doing is they're just getting rid of grease and grime, right? So if you think about it, right, um, you know, whether you've gone to the washroom or you've, uh, you know, walked around a building uh, or, or whatever, you touch things and you get dirt particles, um, other possible things from your food. So food can be greasy. Um, and, uh, and, and within these particles of dirt and grease and whatnot can be microorganisms. So soap is very good at emulsifying, which means getting them into solution, and then you rinse your hands and it's gone. So like I said, not necessarily killing them, but removing them. And this is, this is great, right? You get rid of them and then, you know, problem no more. Uh, you know, obviously there's technique to it, right? Some people are lousy at washing their hands. They kind of just pat their hands together and then they think they're done. Other people are scrubbing and they're getting in around their knuckles and they're worried about getting under their ring and their fingernails and their, all, the, all the nooks and crannies. And that's actually good, right? Um, so, you know, just a little tip. They say, you know, wash your hands. Try to go for 20 seconds. So in your head, sing the alphabet song, right? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that's about, about 20 seconds, right? And, um, and that's about what you should be looking at. And, you know, like I said, some good technique where you're getting around getting the knuckles. Uh, Obviously, longer is better. Uh, and um, I think I've got some other, uh, other information here about hand washing. There's a far side cartoon. <laughs> you know, imagine if restaurants had this kind of thing uh, outside the washroom. Little sign and bell that said, didn't wash hands. That would be uh, pretty embarrassing for some people, I'm sure. So there are many, many, many studies on hand washing. So I've got a couple here to share with you. They're very interesting. Um, here's one here, right? And you can see uh, in this case here, uh, they took a sample of uh, 51 college students, 102 hands, and they're just, you know, using some uh, DNA tests to see what, what are they going to find here. So they found almost 5,000 species. That is just mind-blowing, right? Like, 
That's crazy. Only five of which were in every hand. I thought that was amazing. Just to think of all the things people have been touching. I know some people are getting squirmish right now. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting, right? If you think about all the th possible activities people have been doing in one day, uh, most of them normal activities, right? Washing dishes, uh, using the washroom, uh, working in the garden, etc. cetera. Uh, average hand, about 150 species. Left hand and right hand were only about 17% the same. So this makes sense, right? Most people do certain things only with their dominant hand. You know, every time I grab my pencil, it's with my right hand, you know, almost every single time. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So here is the other interesting thing here. Uh, women's hands have had much greater variety. <laughs> and usually I, I ask people, why, why? What's going on with women? Why do they get so much, much more variety of bacteria? Are they, are they that much dirtier than men? And, you know, usually there's an awkward silence. And then eventually somebody in class, you know, puts her hand up and says, because we just do more work. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what? I mean, on average, it's true. Okay, particularly the dirty work in particular, on average, women are involved in some of those things more often. So little things like washing the dishes. Um, pull every household and find out who does the dishes. You know, I'm talking about not loading the dishwasher. I'm talking about who does the dishes by hand. Um, what about changing diapers? Right. Uh, you know, I think in, uh, you know, every family, there's always somebody who does it more often than somebody else. And the majority of the time, it is the woman. Um, there's other reasons for that as well. Uh, you know, obviously, that some of that is antidotal, but there are studies about, you know, who's doing the housework, and it is true that, uh, that women on average do do more. Um, but there's other things chemistry-wise as well, right? So uh, women, their body temperature and uh, the pH of their blood, uh, it all varies a little bit uh, with their monthly cycles as well. And so that leads to greater variety on, on women as well. Uh, and I think, I, I guess the last thing I didn't mention was, was food preparation, of course, as well. And that's gonna expose people to, again, a, a more, uh, um, a larger variety of, of different organisms. Okay, let's go back to the soap versus hand sanitizer thing. Um, many publications on this. Uh, this one I found, I think this was only done last year. Uh, so this was a daycare study, and so this was, I thought was interesting, and I thought I would share it with you. And they had three groups. So a no-intervention group, an intense hand sanitizer group, and an intense soap and water group. Right? And so you can see what the results are. It said the hand sanitizer group had lower rates of respiratory infection and, miss, and fewer missed day of schools compared to the other two groups. Kids in the hand sanitizer group were also less likely to be prescribed antibiotics for respiratory infections. So this was interesting because um, there are more studies that show soap and water is better than hand sanitizer. And uh, if you read the paper in the discussion, uh, they actually admit that it was really hard to control the factors on this. So they noticed in the daycare that the hand sanitizer, for example, was in a more convenient location than the sink. So maybe it was being used a bit more often, right? Never mind hand sanitizers, uh, you know, washing your hands, like that, that takes a full minute. Right? Who has a minute of time to wash their hands, right? You know, when you're working in a daycare and you've got all these kids, it's hard work uh, getting kids to wash their hands. Hand sanitizer, you can squirt a little bit on them and they can, you know, they can do their own thing. Um, so in some, some cases, you know, there's, there's logistical things uh, with these kind of experiments to kind of control for. But this one was interesting, I thought. And like I said, they, the uh, experimenters did, uh, the investigators did admit that there were, there were some problems with this and recommended that, you know, let's not get rid of soap. It's probably more important, they actually admitted in the end. Uh, here's another one, uh, another recent study. Uh, this is a Japanese study, and um, they showed that some pathogens, such as influenza, actually need a lot longer time than we had thought uh, before they're killed with hand sanitizers, right? So after two minutes of use, the viruses are still, um, are still active in their study. And they're able to show that hand washing with soap actually deactivated. And if you, you don't even have to deactivate it with hand washing. You can just get rid of it off your hand with all the grime and you're in good shape. So lots of studies done on these. Bottom line is hand washing is great. Uh, probably the best thing we can recommend people to do for many, many reasons all over the place just for human health. Um, hand sanitizer if you don't have soap and water handy. Uh, 
why not? It's it's probably not going to harm. It's not. It's probably going to do you some good. Um, here's my other notes. Technique important. I mentioned that about uh, about hand washing. Um, and if you work in a surgical ward, uh, you'll find this. They actually have rules and regulations around um, hand washing. I think it's three minutes. They have to wash for three minutes. And uh, the surgeons, uh, you know, like there's a timer. And I think in some cases, uh, it even has to be witnessed that they're washing their hands and they have a little scrub brush and, you know, all those kind of things around it. Uh, notice this note here. Hand sanitizers are not very effective against norovirus, giardia, and clostridium. So why is that? Norovirus is a non-envelope virus. Giardia has cysts. Clostridium has endospores. All these things are very resistant against hand sanitizers. So this is why hand washing is the gold standard because all three of those things are nasty, very nasty. You do not want to get any of them. So I just want to show you this here. This is another um, antisepsis wipe uh, and uh, this has a detergent in it. This is the same detergent I showed you before. Um, I can't remember where I picked this one up. I actually found it somewhere. Um, maybe it was at a doctor's office and they had some sitting around and I, I uh, took a photo of it. And uh, you can see it's not alcohol using this detergent. Uh, this detergent here, I did look it up and it's, um, it's, uh, it's quite strong, right? Uh, which is why it's such a small concentration. I, I don't know a lot about the chemistry of this particular one, but it is quite a strong detergent. Okay, so moving on, uh, moving on to heavy metals. And uh, we don't exactly use heavy metals that often anymore as chemical disinfectants. Um, silver is something that used to be used historically. Uh, silver nitrate in particular, you can get silver nitrate uh, it's a chemical compound, you can mix it in water, and it has very strong uh, antiseptic properties to it. So what they used to do um, back when silver was not so expensive, believe it or not, silver, uh, silver nitrate used to be relatively affordable. Uh, we used to get it for one of the chemistry labs here, I think 500 grams um, is about $1,200. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, you know, to, to spend on 500 grams or something. But about 20 years ago, 500 grams was only about 100 bucks. So it's gone up. So what do they use silver nitrate for in the hospitals? Um, for babies. So something that is done nowadays still is uh, when you have a baby, one of the first things they do when the baby is born uh, is they put drops of antibiotics in the eyes. Uh, it used to be silver nitrate. Um, but antibiotics, like I said, are just way cheaper than silver nitrate. So we, we just use antibiotics nowadays. And what's the idea behind that? Well, the number one reason is gonorrhea. Um, gonorrhea in the eyes can cause blindness. Uh, and now obviously not every woman having babies, in fact, most of them don't have gonorrhea. Uh, usually that's part of uh, something that you're being tested for uh, when you're pregnant uh, and, and other illnesses that they're concerned about passing to the baby. Um, but uh, there are other bacteria that can cause uh, eye complications. So they find by giving, you know, a drop in each eye of the baby can actually prevent a lot of uh, uh, easily preventable complications and uh, so very, very easy to do. Mercury is also antiseptic. I, I hope nobody's using mercury um, because it is very toxic and can actually cause you to go crazy. Um, so something else that is kind of making a comeback and I, I've seen again some ads on this is copper. You can see I have a petri dish here and some old copper pennies are put on the petri dish and where the copper is there's no growth in the microorganism. Um, historically people will have these copper jugs and uh, water stays fresh in them and like I said you're starting to see some advertisements around copper people saying you can buy copper doorknobs and that is going to protect you at your home against pathogens and whatnot and it's true copper has antiseptic properties. Again we're looking at heavy metals that are um, just relatively reactive uh, uh, chemical species, and they denature proteins. Okay, so we're almost done with the chemicals. I know this is a lot of chemicals for you, right? And lots of different names, and if you're really familiar with chemistry, you're like, oh yeah, aldehyde, no problem, right? Um, so I'm trying to point out, like I said, where you may have seen these things before. Aldehydes, you may have seen them before, but you had no idea, and uh, there's a whole bunch of these aldehydes out there. The classic aldehyde is formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. Uh, we don't use that anymore because it is carcinogenic. 
So we do not want to be using carcinogenic things. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other compounds that are aldehydes. So if you're really interested in the chemistry, this here is an aldehyde. It looks something like that. We have a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, and a hydrogen. So what does that mean? It means it's reactive. It's going to uh, react with proteins, and it's going to damage them. So why are aldehydes important? They're cheap. Super, super cheap. You can buy these giant jugs. Here's one here, uh, OPA, so that's orthothelaldehyde, I guess. Uh, that one's really common, uh, and you're not even going to use that direct. You're going to dilute it, right? So you're probably going to add, you know, um, a little bit and then a, a liter of water or something like that. And um, whenever you see disinfectants almost everywhere, often you see in aldehydes, sometimes bleach, right? Just kind of depends on who's using it. So you may see people disinfecting something uh, in a store that you go to. Um, janitors have these in their closets everywhere. Uh, like I said, super, super cheap. And uh, that's kind of the main reason why we're using it. There's a whole bunch out there. There used to be one, um, we used to wipe our bench down in the lab. I don't, I have no idea what it was. And it was an aldehyde and it was pink. So we just called it pink death. Uh, but like I said, it was super cheap. Cheap. You get these giant jugs of it. You, uh, you just add a tiny bit to your, your squirt bottle and then the rest water and um, it's disinfecting all the surfaces. So this is why aldehydes are, are important. They're very cheap. Bleach is very cheap too. So probably most times people are using one or the other. Bleach has often a bit more of an odor to it, um, uh, which some people find unpleasant. Okay, so one other really important compound here is ethylene oxide. So ethylene oxide is a very reactive, very dangerous gaseous chemical. So you can see, again, we have something else that is damaging proteins, but it works so well. So why are we going to use ethylene oxide if it's so dangerous? Well, sometimes there is equipment that, like, what are you going to do? You can't throw it in the autoclave. Uh, you can't hit it with UV irradiation. Uh, how are you going to clean it out? You know, you can imagine all sorts of instruments. I have the example here, heart and lung machine, right? You're not going to go and disassemble it so that you can put each, some parts in the autoclave and wipe down some parts and et cetera, et cetera, right? So they have these machines, ethylene oxide sterilizers that are found. I don't know if they're found in all hospitals, but I think uh, they're, they're pretty standard, usually in their own special room, uh, a well-vented room and, uh, and all that. And these machines are vented uh, very particularly, you know, um, out, outside and, and so on. Uh, and the gas goes in there and it's going to, uh, it's going to sterilize everything. Uh, these are a little bit more common in medical supply company factories. So I'd mentioned before that some instruments, like I, I showed you the syringes and the, um, the Petri dishes are UV sterilized. Uh, well, there's a lot of things that, again, the UV can't penetrate to it. So they have these massive ethylene oxide sterilizers. And uh, as part of the assembly line, things get sterilized and packaged up and then sent off to uh, you know, hospitals and clinics or whoever's buying, you know, whatever it is that they're selling. And so this is really, really common for, for some devices um, that, that uh, kind of nothing else works for them. And it works really, really well. Okay, so this is the last part of this topic. You can see I've mentioned antibiotics. Um, we're not usually using antibiotics to disinfect things. We're more using them for treatment. Some cases they have been used as uh, disinfectants. Not a good idea. We don't want to have our drugs be uh, uh, useless and resistance evolve, um, but uh, sometimes you see that. So we are going to talk about antibiotics in the next topic. So I have a few more things to kind of finish up this topic, and I have a Kahoot for you coming up to see if we can uh, discuss these things in a different way. But one thing to talk about is uh, how we can test these things, right? How can we know which one is better than another? Like, you know, you're tasked with going to the store and you see five jugs of different types of disinfectant on the shelf. You know, what do you, which one's better, right? Obviously, sometimes expense is a big thing and so on. Uh, one thing you can do is the in-use test. So the in-use test basically means that you just try it out, right? But you, you test your environment, so you swab before and after, right? And uh, so this is, you know, something that uh, takes a little bit of time and effort and, and there may be some issues with how the area was swabbed and all that, but, you know, this is not a bad thing to do because we want to know, is it working? 
And uh, it may not tell you exactly how much, but it might tell you it's actually working. So we can be a little bit more scientific about this. And we can do um, uh, different types of tests. One type of test is called a dilution test or a ring test. And so what we're going to do is you're going to have some cultures of some different types of bacteria, right? So salmonella or E. coli. So this is kind of your token gram negative. And then you'll have a staphylococcus. It could be aureus or epidermidis. And this is kind of your token gram positive. Okay, uh, I think there are some tests that use endospore form in organisms, but not, uh, not part of the standard ring test thing. And then Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So what is the deal with Pseudomonas aeruginosa? So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram negative. And I'll say this, it's very tough. So what do I mean by very tough? Pseudomonas is just one of those organisms that is just something biologically about it. Uh, it's quite resistant to a lot of antibiotics, just naturally, and also a lot of disinfectants. So you can see how the test works here, right? You have some, uh, some metal rings. So by a metal ring, it's kind of like a, basically a wire. It's got a little ring on the end. Uh, it gets stuck in the culture, it's dried, and then it's stuck in the disinfectant. And you can see that the disinfectant has varying concentrations, right? So you could make it, uh, you know, whatever the concentration is, you know, 10, uh, 10 milligrams per liter, 20 milligrams per liter, 30 milligrams per liter, and so on. Leaving the disinfectant for 10 minutes, and then you put the, uh, the rings in some culture media and see if they grow. So here you're actually getting, uh, I thought I had a, a picture of this test. So anyway, so all you're doing is just testing the disinfectant, different concentrations, different bacteria, and now you have a bar to say that this disinfectant is effective at 10 milligrams per liter. This disinfectant is effective at 15 milligrams per liter. So this is something that can be used to kind of quantitatively give an idea. And this is something that wouldn't be done like hospital. This would be done by a manufacturer. And then they would talk about the standards that they've used. And, and like I said, sometimes you do see E. coli instead of salmonella. Uh, but uh, gives people an idea of how strong this disinfectant is. Plus it gives a manufacturer the idea of how much to tell people to dilute it to uh, when, they, when they buy it and sell it. Uh, something that is done, uh, you see this kind of thing, uh, usually every year at the science fair, I see at least one project that does this kind of thing. You know, some kid is testing mouthwash or, or, or you know, um, culinary spices or whatnot. Um, but a quick and dirty way to check something is called a disc diffusion test. It's also called a Kirby Bauer assay, but uh, you know, named after a couple of people. So what you do is you get a little uh, filter paper and it gets soaked in something, right? So uh, it could be disinfectant, a mouthwash, an antibiotic, whatever. And then it goes on a petri dish that has a lawn of bacteria. And, uh, and then you look for that zone of inhibition. So you can see on the left here, we have staphylococcus and everything seems to be still in killing staphylococcus. We have chlorine, we have O-phenol, hexachlorophenine, so a bunch of different uh, disinfectants there. You can see E. coli, this one here, the hexachlorophene, um, doesn't seem to be killing E. coli at all. Uh, chlorine seems to be most effective, the other two somewhere in the middle. Pseudomonas seems entirely resistant to at least three of these disinfectants. So, you know, there's the three organisms and you can see the effectiveness right there on them. Very easy visually. You can measure the size of that zone of inhibition and try to make some, you know, conclusions about it. Uh, not quite as, as scientific and specific as the, uh, as the ring test, but like I said, this is quick and dirty, visual, easy to see, easy to read, easy to understand. Okay, so, I'm going to show you this here, and then I have a coot for you, and, and then that will be the end of the day. Um, so on the midterm, I am going to have some sort of scenario around disinfection and sterilization. So here's one uh, I, from, I think, uh, maybe two or three years ago. I used this one here, and, uh, you know, the scenario is going to ask you to disinfect or sterilize something. So that's the first part of the question is you need to read the question and see what it's asking. Right? So in this case here, it's asking us to disinfect the floor after a patient has vomited. Okay, 
Um, so disinfect usually implies chemicals. In fact, the question actually says chemicals. So you do want to make sure that you are talking about chemicals here. Okay. And the reason why I'm saying this so strongly, because I remember having this question and at least more than one person said, the first thing you're going to do is autoclave the waiting room. And I'm thinking, no, <laughs> you're not going to autoclave the waiting room. The waiting room is probably bigger than the autoclave and there's people in there. You can't just, you can't just do that. Right? So I want you to, you know, think about what you're doing uh, to it and it should make sense. Right? Um, I'll give you another example, something that I gave, uh, I think, I don't remember if it was last year or not, but uh, a tray of, um, of surgical instruments, right? Uh, that case you would use an autoclave, right? So it's going to ask you to describe some different methods to deal with the situation and exactly what these things are doing, right? And some answers are going to be right, some answers are going to be a little less right, uh, and that's how, kind of how it, it's, it's going to be graded, right? In that you are answering the question and you are giving me a description of what's going on. Uh, so make sure to read the question. I don't have the scenario yet. I'm not giving you any hints other than that there is going to be a scenario type question. So when you're studying, what I'm saying is you don't need to learn all the chemicals and all the, the methods. And I know they're very confusing, but kind of learn the important ones and think about what, uh, what might be used in, let's say, a hospital. Okay, because uh, that's obviously what's important um, if you are going to be a nurse someday, uh, is understanding what's going to be used in a hospital. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the Kahoot now, and uh, I've got some hard questions in there, and we'll discuss them as we go along. So you can load up Kahoot, and uh, let's see here, there we go. There we go. Looks like I actually have volume today. Video unavailable. Video is private. Okay, I guess I don't have a video for you, but we do have a Kahoot. So um, load up the number and we'll get started in one minute. Okay, maybe 20 more seconds. Okay, not a lot of people in there today, but I'm gonna start it anyway, and there's some good questions here for us to discuss. Uh, so if you wanna join in uh, afterwards, the, uh, the pin, game pin number will be at the bottom of the screen. So what is sterilization? Sterilization, the process of destroying all microbial life. So hopefully that was an easy one. Uh, sterilization may not kill prions, but like I said, prions aren't even alive. Um, so if you are dealing with prions, usually you're looking at incineration or something like that, uh, basically getting rid of any contaminated material. Thankfully, they're not that common to deal with. Ellen is super fast. All of the following are antiseptics except you got to remember what antisepsis is for this question. So all the following antiseptics, meaning things you'll use on your skin. So bleach is kind of the one that you probably shouldn't use on your skin. It's quite reactive. The other ones are fine. Um, Probably even prolonged exposure of all those things aren't going to harm you too much, although bleach will. Question three, medical manufacturers use this method.
So the correct answer is ethylene oxide gas. Um, some of them will use autoclaves, but not kind of routinely. The idea behind the um, uh, manufacturing is that you're producing something, probably dry, that's gonna get shipped. So ethylene oxide gas and UV are the most common for medical manufacturers, unless they're dealing with liquids. I guess uh, that would be the exception. Uh, they might autoclave or filter sterilize liquids. Okay, Henry coming in hot. Question four, true or false? Envelope viruses are more resistant to disinfectants than protocysts. The answer is false. So remember, envelope viruses um, are actually quite fragile. That uh, envelope, that membrane on the outside, makes it susceptible to all sorts of things like alcohols, hand sanitizers, uh, detergents, uh, you name it. Uh, protocysts are quite resistant, not quite as resistant as endospores, uh, but pretty close. Dry heat sterilization is used for Items that cannot get wet. So good job. Question six, ionizing radiation is high energy and non-ionizing radiation is low energy. The answer is true. Ionizing radiation actually breaks bonds. So we're talking about gamma rays, x-rays, and higher intensity UV rays. Question seven, phenols and phenolics are useful because they evaporate quickly, true or false? So the answer is false. So remember, phenols and phenolics include things like Mr. Clean or Pine Sol. They're relatively persistent chemicals, which is a good advantage for cleaning floors uh, or surfaces like that. You want them to persist and maybe you know do their uh, you know have their antibacterial action a little bit longer than if you use something like alcohol, which is going to evaporate very very quickly. Okay, last question. True or false, surfactant refers to alcohols and ethanols. Ooh, everyone's split on this. No, surfactant does not. It refers to soaps and detergents. Alcohols and ethanols are referred to as alcohols. <laughs> so, okay. Let's see how we did. Bronze. I think I'm seeing some of the same names again and again. So well done, folks. Don't feel bad if you're not doing so well on the cahoots. Some people are just very fast. And uh, it's more important that you do do well on the, uh, on the midterm. So 50% correct uh, from everyone today. Um, I realize there's these statistics. Um, usually people do a little bit better, but I, this is a bit of a harder topic and I did throw some difficult questions in there. So don't feel bad. Uh, whole idea is to study and reinforce and learn for the midterm. So looks like we are at 1150. So I think that is all for today. Uh, so next day we'll be talking about antibiotics, which is one of my, actually I have many favorite topics, but antibiotics is, has a special place in my heart because uh, I've done a lot of research on antibiotics. And uh, so um, it has just, like I said, that little special place in my heart. So that'll be next day. Uh, so I will see you then. Hope you have a wonderful Thursday and a great weekend.